know it's no pain, no gain Go hard till the end What's the use of playing a game If you ain't aiming to win my feet Good, thank you. I noticed a cool t-shirt. There are only 10 types of people in the world. Those who know binary and those who don't. That's a math joke. I got one for you. There's only three types of people in the world. Those who know math and those who don't. <laughs> okay. Question is, are we in a bubble? I got Donald Trump to say, we're in the greatest bubble in history or something like that. I'm going to go through this really quickly and then I would like this to be interactive. So please pull your questions up. I saw most of you had no opinion on whether it's a bubble. That's just wrong. So I'm going to ask the question again. How many think we are in a bubble? Come on, everybody's got to vote. Okay, that's better. How many think we're not in a bubble? Okay, interesting. How many didn't vote? There's like one of you. Did you vote? Oh, you voted, okay. You voted, all right. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> First of all, you probably know these very, very storied figures in venture capital. They all think we're in a bubble. Fred's actually been saying we're in a bubble since 2010. Uh, Mark Suster, I, for two years I thought, somebody told me, no, 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 it's now for three years. They all think we're in a bubble. You can see that. They've been worried about the bubble. It's a weird thing because 2000s, everybody's head, everybody's really worried about a bubble. These guys think it's over already. What they're worried about is this. There's no IPOs anymore to speak of, but there's private IPOs. Look at the money that's running into basically private rounds. I could do 10 charts like this. They all have the same story. The money's flowing into big, late-stage private rounds. And all bubbles have the same shape. Do we all remember the housing bubble? We all remember that. It's a parabolic rise up and then poof, drops. There's your parabolic rise up. So people look at that chart and go, oh my God, this is going to end and end badly. Now, the bubble is in the late stages. If you ask most people in venture, they'll say, well, the bubble's in these series D and E and these late stage things. And you can see this is, you know, series A, B, C, D. You can see as you go up the later letters, it gets more bubbly. The valuations in this case are going parabolic up. That's that parabolic curve thing. All right, I actually found out that a pride of lions, it's a blessing of unicorns. We've been blessed with unicorns. You can see the pace of unicornness is just increasing like crazy. I think probably half of us, how many wish we had a better word than unicorn for unicorns? Okay. I, I know, I know. Aileen Lee, wonderful venture person, spun out of Kleiner Perkins to do cowboy ventures. Great name for a venture fund. She wrote an article in 2013 where she coined the term unicorn. Unicorn is a billion dollar or higher company. And she was trying to count the number of unicorns over the prior 10 years. And at the time, she only counted 39. Somebody else did the study and came up with 45, but it's, you know, so what? 39, 45. Now we have well over 100 in the US. And you can see most of them just happened. You've also heard of decacorns, decacorn, 10 billion and above. Dave McClure came up with Centaur, 100 million to a billion, and Pony, which is I think 20 million. So I asked Dave, come on, are you a My Little Pony guy? So I think that's what he came from. Anyway, ponies. All right, Square is about to go public. This is a chart the Wall Street Journal said about Square going public. And this is one of the great things that we're all concerned about on the venture side about unicorns. Square is a, a pretty multiple unicorn. It almost got to the decacorn level. But take a look. Its peak money has dropped. This current IPO, they're on the road right now, is beginning to price below the prior unicorn price. And this creates a really big question. When all these decacorns try to go public, will the public markets slam their price down below their prior price? And does that mean the bubble's already bursting? Is the unicorn bubble about to go down to centaur level or pony level? This has caused the venture community, yes, yes, we're inventing all these new words, unicorps. <laughs> I also tried once to invent unicorn for a fake unicorn, but that didn't catch on. Unicorps, okay. 
These are well-known companies that people say, oh my God, they're not worth what they're worth. It really all started because Dropbox had late-stage investors, mutual funds, people that normally invest in public markets, did the private round in Dropbox. And they recently had to market to market and they dropped the valuation, I think, from 10 billion to eight. So it's no longer a decacorn. And this caused a lot of anxiety and excitement in the venture world. But that got people on a Unicorps watch. So these are some people, I was at a meeting and somebody said, who's gonna be the next one to fail And Unicorps? I actually said Unicorps, I may have coined this term, I hate to say it. Um, Evernote came up, Evernote, Unicorn three years ago has gone nowhere since. Uh, do you pronounce that Theranos, Theranos? <laughs> the Reynos, Theranos? Wonderful, interesting company with a, a wonderful female founder, but is now the Wall Street Journal is just dumping all over her, trying to claim her technology is fraudulent. So now she's on the list. Flipboard, we work, we work. Um, I don't know if they're a five billion value or 10 billion. Do you guys all know we work? Sure, okay, are they 10 billion? Do you have any idea? Seven, not even a deck of corn. Why should I even bring them up? Okay, we work, you know, renting out space to people like you. So there's a famous company in the dot com era called Exodus. It was web hosting, and it was the last one to fall because when the dot coms began running out of money, they never turned off their website till the very, very end. Then everything fell off a cliff. So web, it was a multi-billion-dollar company that came down to earth. People are worried that we work is presuming a continuation of the unicornness of the world. Instacart, uh, very, 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 it's like, we all went through this with Webvan, do they have any positive gross margins? Jet, they just raised 500 million on a billion value, they're uh, competing with Amazon. So it's a very low margin business. Okay, there's more, you could do this for party games. My hope is all of them go public, all our children are above average. <laughs> okay, let me get a little deeper. We all know junk bonds. Michael Milken went to jail. Do you remember junk bonds? So they're high, they're high interest rate bonds that they use to buy companies in a wonderful era of LBOs and all this. So some people, including myself, think these Series E's are the new junk bond. This is um, the guy now running YC, Sam Altman, a very good thinker in the business. You can read what he wrote. He says the reason why these unicorns have really high values is not because they're really worth that, but because the late stage investors pack such wonderful protective terms that these rounds are really debt more than equity, and the valuation is artificially high. Yeah, you've heard this before. Yeah, I'm picking on you. I see it. So there's a thing in venture that I'll give you any price you want if you give me the terms I want. So if you play with really clever terms, you can have a billion dollar value. But when they meet the public markets, the public markets create a real value. And so a lot of people think because of that, a lot of these unicorn decacorn valuations will come down to the real world, not this mythical world, when they hit the public markets. Now the other problem is this. There's another great Wall Street Journal thing, they, but they love tech. IPO is a new down round. These are a series of recent IPOs and they're all coming down to earth. And that doesn't bode well for the whole bubble story, does it? There's some other, I call them ominous similarities to 2000. By the way, any of you, any of you from the 2000 era remember it? You remember it. So Roger mentioned one company, Kova, went out in 98. I had another one that I took public in 99, Intertrust, one of my favorite companies ever. I pitched it, it was great fun. Private jets, top of the bubble, went to a Yankees game afterwards in New York City. They got to a nine billion market value on one million, one million of trailing revenue. For a week, we were the most overvalued company in the history of the NASDAQ. We were number one. <laughs> Believe me, I miss these days. These were great days back then. But this, what this chart tells you is, that's the percent of companies that were unprofitable going public in the height of the bubble. It's worse today. Does that make you feel good? Anybody feel good right now? Okay. There's some other things I just have to throw out. There's a lot of indicators in the stock market. You guys heard about the tallest building indicator? You have. 
You've heard about this. This is like a male thing, I guess. So, right before, right when the Great Depression, you know, came, we built the Chrysler Building, the World, you know, the uh, Empire State World Trade Center. Right before this thing collapsed around 69, 70, you get the idea. The Petronas Towers, or Asian flu hit. This huge building in Dubai, then the 2008 thing hit, and guess what? Salesforce is building the tallest building in San Francisco. Built on top of it. You got it. It's going to be the tallest building west of Chicago. West of Chicago. So the Sears, Willows, whatever it's called, Tower still beats it. Okay. This doesn't bode well. Now I have one other personal anecdote. So before we go to the next page, I'll tell you the anecdote. I'm in New York about a month ago. A good friend of mine says, you got to hear this pitch. Okay. So two kids pitched me. And they basically had a, not a very impressive idea. I said, well, who's the techie? Well, we don't have a tech team. Okay. Do um, you have a demo? No, we don't have a demo. Do you have a PowerPoint? We got a PowerPoint. And so they're pitching me, and they'll probably raise money in New York right now. So this reminded me of this old Dilbert cartoon. <laughs> Can you guys see this? Um, the shoeshine boy indicator, you may remember this story. The patriarch of the Kennedy clan, Joseph Kennedy, was in Wall Street in 1929, right before the Great Crash. And he was getting his shoe shined. And the, you know, the shoe shine stand's probably still there. And the shoe shine boy was saying, I got this great stock tip, you gotta go buy it. So he said, I'm a professional, I'm in the business. If a shoe shine guy is giving me stock tips, I'm getting out of the market. So he sold all his, he said he sold everything right before the crash. It's called the shoe shine by indi indicator. So when two people with nothing pitch you on a deal and they're going to make a million, you know, they're going to be a billionaire. These are all indications of the top. Now, great Wall Street aphorism. Have you guys heard this? Bull markets climb a wall of worry. Nobody's heard this. Bear markets, by the way, slide down a slope of hope. <laughs> so. What I just went through is an incredible wall of worry. You got Fred Wilson worried since 2010. Oh my God, things are getting too expensive. And all these storied VCs, it's going to end badly. It's it's going to be it's a bubble. By the way, my impression when I hear all that in this is, it's not a bubble yet. Back in 2000 and 1999, uh, one of the great I won't mention her name, but one of the great VCs made a statement that went public, which is, I know I shouldn't do it, but I gotta invest in this company. <laughs> in other words, in a bubble, you suspend all your normal disbelief and just go willy-nilly into the craziness. When these people are saying, no, I shouldn't do it, it's a bubble, you're not in a bubble. So my indicator of the bubble is when very all these people say, you know, gosh, I really gotta get back in the market. Now. It's very clear there's no bubble in the public markets for tech. This is the dot. See this? This is great. Parabolic rise up. That's a classic bubble. Parabolic rise up falls like a rock. It makes one attempt to get back to the top, and then it falls down. Now, I must say, when I took Intertrust public, it was October 99, which is about right here. We did a secondary offering right there at the peak of the secondary peak. And then, bloop, it fell like a rock. That's what a bubble looks like. Do you see this bubble here? NASDAQ has risen, but this thing in the lower line is the PE ratio. It's not nutty. Here, it got nutty. Down here, it's not nutty. This is not a crazy bubble indicator. Here's a second thing. Um, I try to come up with a clever headline, but here's the point. There's actually been two prior bubbles in tech in recent history. That's the dot-com bubble. This is the 1983 PC bubble. Yes, I was alive then, I'm sorry to say. But I, this is, the, this is the, the second highest peak in the period of tech was 1983. There was a company that went public called Kentucky Fried Computers. <laughs> you can look it up. They changed their name to North Star, but you get the idea. There was a company in Boulder, Colorado called NBI. Nothing but initials. It was a nutty period. And I, had, I, I was a young pup at the time, and I had one company that got out in June of 83 <coughs> called Intertron, and a company called Digitex that couldn't get out in July of 83. The market closed like a rock around the 4th of July. Done. 
had a secondary peak here and then it was over with for a long time. We're not there yet. Look at that. We're not even close. So there's clearly no tech IPO bubble going on in the public markets. Here's my favorite slide. This was about a month old, but it hasn't gone any worse. In 1998, we had the Asian flu. Russia was going bankrupt. All kinds of bad things were occurring. And somebody overlaid the current stock market that had a big crash or a big problem over the summer with the 98 market. It's eerie, isn't it? And this market bounced recently right on time, and it kept going up. Does anybody know where the NASDAQ is today? Curious. Can somebody look it up? Because this is a NASDAQ. I think it's up in this range. Yeah, 5020 or 5200? No, I think it's 5020. Okay, so it's right about in here, just like we expected after a little bit of a glitch. It's eerie when this happens. Now, pattern recognition doesn't mean it's going to continue. But I'm asking myself, are we actually in 1998? Now, most of you who didn't live through the bubble don't remember this. But let me show you some headlines in the Wall Street Journal in September 98 when eBay went public. You probably can't read this. eBay breaks that long, dry spell of IPOs. The IPO market's longest dry spell since 1985 may be about to come to an end. Somebody quotes here, well, eBay's success is unlikely to beckon a new batch of IPOs. Ever seen headlines that were this wrong before? <laughs> anyway, September 1998, nobody thought it was a bubble. It had a year and a half of almost no IPOs. Everybody was grumpy and morose, and, they, and this thing happened. When that thing went public and went really well in the public markets, we had 18 months of the NASDAQ going vertical. So I'm asking the question, how can a bubble burst when it hasn't happened yet? So what I'm basically arguing to everybody, happy unicorn, what I'm arguing to everybody is that the bubble is in front of us. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe Square starts the book. Square is going to go public in a couple weeks. It's on a roadshow. It's going to price a little higher than the story in that chart I had. Maybe that stock goes up 50%. Little bell's going to ring. You mentioned bell's ringing. Bell's going to ring. And a flood of unicorn IPOs will start spawning themselves upriver up into this market. And we shall see. One other thing to comment on. We'll probably be asked this question, Roger, there's Roger. The question is, why do bubbles occur? Let me sort of preemptively answer it. Every technology in history came in with a boom or a bubble. Canals, railroads, twice. Cars, there was an auto bubble, Henry Ford auto bubble, 1914 to 19. Then the market crashed 72%. Everything comes in, PCs, came in with a bubble. It's human nature to get irrationally exuberant and try to get on, onto the party. And they all crash, and then after they crash, the winners consolidate and win big. So it's just human nature. Bubbles aren't to be feared. They're something to be hoped for, actually. But they do end badly. The second thing, though, is that usually bubbles go wacky, not because of tech, but because of other forces. In 1998, the Federal Reserve flooded liquidity into the market. And then it continued because it was afraid of something called Y2K, which turned to be a fizzle. In 2000, as the bubble was peaking, the Fed pulled the you know, cookie out of the cookie jar, raised interest rates, and pulled liquidity out. We went down. We sort of saw this with a housing bubble, right? They pumped a lot of cheap liquidity in, then they took it out at the peak of the bubble, and things crashed. So the question is, are we going to have another liquidity pump of that magnitude soon? I think we might. It's something, the story looks something like this. Global markets are really in turmoil. <coughs> Money's flowing into the U.S., flight to quality, out of both China and Europe. The, the Fed might raise rates in December. I don't think it really matters. But I think you're going to see a huge fund of money flood of money coming to the U.S. as the rest of the world slows down and begins to collapse to escape whatever fate it has. That's our Y2K liquidity pump. 
And that money is going to spill over into tech stocks. So the IPO thing may open up next year just when just gobs of money came rushing into all U.S. assets, treasury bonds, stocks, and IPOs. And then we might have a glorious year and a half, and then we all go off and either party or have a long vacation. All right, thank you. Let's get into Q&A. Roger? All right. Let's get some questions here. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Well, I have a comment about the, the bubble thing. Um, what happened in, in, in the late 1990s was the beginning of the internet, you know, the real beginning when people were just beginning to get online in a serious way and everybody could see it all coming and people were throwing money after things that were nothing, you know, Napster and things like that. And then it all crashed when, it, when, when a lot of these companies had no foundation. I think that the difference today is that companies are coming out with real value, you know, I, I, I say that Invention is the mother of necessity, you know, they invent something and then everybody has to have one, you know. And uh, I think that when you have a, a product that actually is useful in doing something good, and, and because of the new platforms we have with cell phones and tablets and everybody connected, that there's a lot more reality-based solidity in the products and the companies, and that's why I think that, you know, I agree with you that there really isn't a bubble. It's going up, but it's going up based on a more solid foundation than it did in the 90s. That's my two cents, I don't know what you think about that. Well, a lot of people have made that argument. The argument is, we're doing real revenues. Back then, they were all fake little revenues. And yet, I showed you this page, if I go back here, that should give you a little bit of a heartburn. This one. Number of IPOs that are quality or not quality. Now, of course, the quantity today is very low versus then. But why would all the crappy IPOs go out instead of the good one? The fact is, every tech bubble, PC bubble, which ended in 83, uh, and then obviously the dot-com bubble, has real value being created. There was a very prescient comment made by uh, Mayoshi Soon, who runs SoftBank. He made this around 98, 97. He said, in 1987, after the PC bubble crashed, he took a lot of money and he spread it across the top 40 companies that emerged out of the crash. He made 40 times his money from 87 to 97. He made more after the bubble because the winners had emerged than before. If you go to, I did this analysis thinking how brilliant that was in about 2002. And after the dot com bubble, I counted 200 companies that had emerged of huge quality that were going to become the big winners going forward. And we can see them today, Amazon being one of, of many examples. Um, so I think what's going to happen after this era is there will be some quantum of companies, maybe it's 200, maybe five, that will have serious value like you're talking about. And over the next 10 years, they're going to be enormous wins. Okay? Just the nature of booms and busts. Yes, question in the back. Roger. So my, my question is that um, you're probably familiar, The Economist ran an article maybe a month, six weeks ago on the Silicon Valley one where they basically said what's fundamentally different this time is that who's going to take the hurt is going to be the private private money and not the public market. So it might have a less systemic effect on the whole economy when it does crash. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that question is the most important question. Now, to some extent, there's a two sides to that question. So if everybody understands the question, what happened on... This era is very weird in that we did so much over-regulation after the 2000 bubble. I mean, we did Sarbanes-Oxley, we, we used decimalization, destroyed the small investment bank. Elliot Spitzer demonizes analysts, so the analysts were divorced from the bankers. And so mid-cap and small-cap stocks have no support in the market. So only the big dogs get out. And the implication on the negative side is this. You could have bought Amazon, I think it was 96, 97 when it went public, probably 96. It was about a 400 million market cap company. You could have bought into that as a public retail investor. What's it worth today? 250 billion? That 400 to 250 would have gone into your wallet. When Facebook went public, you're right. It didn't go public till it's worth 100 billion dollars or 85, whatever it was. And so the small retail investor had no chance of participating in getting rich. It's like we used to democratize wealth and the so-called solutions of after the bubble took it away from the small investor and threw it into the insiders. Evil people like me, I'm wearing black today, so, you know. It exacerbates the whole uh, 
too. Yes. So you're saying that because these big institution insiders are able to be more cautious and more careful, they won't have a bubble collapse. No, no, not saying that. They're the ones who take the hurt. Yes. More than the, more than the individual investors. Although it still have the same effect of drawing up investment. Yeah, okay. I think that's true just because we haven't democratized wealth. But eventually, individual investors put their money in fidelity. I don't have a chart here, but if you look at who is actually putting money in these unicorn private IPO late rounds, it's not the venture industry. It's fidelity. It's the people that have your mutual fund money are the ones that are putting money into these. And so you will ultimately take the hurt. But it won't be the same character. However, I'll one more comment. People make the assumption that the retail investor is dumb money, gets too exuberant, rises Tesla to an unusually high height, it's going to rise it down. But that these sophisticated big company investors aren't like that. History says that's not true. <laughs> They're equally as caught up in the excitement and equally lose money as to the individual. They just have a more sophisticated way to talk about it. Okay, next question. Uh, we'll take one more here and then we'll go to the audience, live audience. Um, Go ahead, James. So, uh, one of my questions is, you look at a lot of the you look at a lot of the companies that are being valued based on their user base, these monster user bases, and they're associating value to the, the, the quantity of users. Do you think that that era is coming to an end? And do you think that there's going to be a, a, a reconciliation or a rebound effect that happens as, as a result of that era coming to an end? It's another very good question. If you look at uh, how many of you use Snapchat. Are we all too old? Some of you do, okay. The rest of you guys are all too old, right? Anyway, Snapchat has got a huge audience of centennials and younger millennials. Centennial, by the way, is the next thing after millennial. Um, and they're making no money. They're, they're worth, I don't know, 13 billion? Anybody know? 30 billion, 20 billion? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's say they're worth something like that, 20 billion. They, uh, they're probably in my unicorn chart somewhere. Um, I think they did 50 million of revenue. We'll do 50 million this year. There's no economic way you can justify 50 million revenue being worth 15 or 20 billion dollars, unless you believe they'll monetize all these people to such a degree they'll grow like crazy, right? If you go back to 2000, the big complaint was we're valuing companies on eyeballs, and they're not monetizing. And so when the musical chairs stopped, all the eyeball companies just evaporated. So the answer, I think, to your question is this. Snapchat seems to be able to rapidly monetize. They're going to have a race with the end of the bubble. Can they monetize to the point where their monetization catches up to the value before the musical chairs stop? I don't think it's that different today versus then, even though people argue it's different. In fact, the thing you should always be afraid of are the words, this time it's different. Right? By the way, the more you hear that, the more I'm in the bubble world. Okay. People say, no, nah, it's okay to do it. This time it's different. That's when you say, okay, I'm going to hold on to my wallet. People are starting to say that. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. We one back here. Uh, just let's get one from uh, the virtual audience. I think this comes from New York or Seattle. Um, what are some aspects other than high valuations that are common between now and the dot com era that support the possibility of a bubble? That's, uh, that's a tough one to answer quickly and succinctly. There's so many, I don't know where to start. The real question should be, what is different? You try to argue it's different because they're making more money, right? But no, there's a lot of companies valued on monthly active users instead of eyeballs that don't look any different, right? And so I don't think it's any different. And I think this is one of the sort of Proof points, they shouldn't assume it's any different. The only real difference is we're not yet in the bubble. So you're saying it's to come. Oh yeah. All in terms of your, your no, best no, guess. history is clear. Boom, bust. There's never boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, if you go on saying there's a bubble for long enough, you'll be right eventually. Well, the other way to put it is this, the other thing to think about is some people think, why can't we just grow steadily and never get there? And the answer is that's not human nature. It just doesn't go that way. So it's going to keep growing. You may get another year or two, but you're not going to get a decade of 
happy, steady growth, everything is good. Doesn't and Twitter way. may be, uh, uh, Square may be the catalyst, in your opinion. Fingers crossed, okay. okay. I'd love it if it were true. You got, look, you got one of the coolest founders of the era. And I think on his video, his IPO, do you guys see his IPO video? It's out. They all wore black. It's like totally cool, doubly cool. He's got the beard. No, and Jack is actually an amazing, amazing entrepreneur. I don't mean to make fun of it at all. He is an amazing guy. And so, and they have a really good team. All the pieces are in place. Let's see. Question here. I'm, I'm older than I look, so I kind of remember the, the dot com boom. Um, was what I don't remember about that being a derivatives market as big as it is today is could that be really what the boom or what the, what the, what the bubble is today as opposed to like the public market of you know the Nasdaq and the, by know, derivatives you mean options calls that kind of stuff yeah stuff. I don't remember it being anywhere near as big as it was as it is today as it was well back then. I, so tech market so let me put it this way. Do we all know the concept of creating alpha versus beta? Is that a it's sort of a stock market term? There's even a, a website called Seeking Alpha, kind of cool name. So beta is more of the systemic ref, risk of the market. Are you clever with financial engineering? Alpha is did you create real value? If you look over the whole world right now, there's no value in China. There's no value in the BRICS. Uh, Goldman Sachs said the BRICS are dead. There's no longer any value in fracking. Oil's dropping down, it's like 43 today. The only place in the whole world that's creating alpha, meaning real value and growth, not financial engineering, tech. You're sitting here in like one little peninsula up to San Francisco, which is creating more growth and value than the whole rest of the world combined. So what's interesting about that is that money Money is a funny thing. It'll, it flows downhill, avoids rocks, and it seeks alpha. It'll seek alpha. It'll come into the tech world. And I don't think derivatives have much to do with it because that's a whole different problem. Let me, let me say this differently. So you guys all, one of the, there's a couple of mistakes made in the 90s in regulation. One was getting rid of Glass-Steagall, and that turned Wall Street into a casino for you know, speculation, not investing in real business. Second was decimalization, which decimated the small investment bank we used to live on. The third was they didn't regulate derivatives. They didn't put them on an exchange. And a crazy idea. And there's something, I've seen numbers as high as $600 trillion of derivative interest out there. And they all think the calls and the puts will offset. What's well, like you're shooting a little rocket to the moon? What if you're off by three degrees? Okay, what is, I don't know, 10 degrees? That's $60 trillion you missed. That's bigger than the whole US economy. Right? So it's a risk. In my thesis that this flood of money flight to go out into the U.S. from the collapse of the rest of the world to drive liquidity as a liquidity pump into our markets, spill into tech, we have an IPO. That's a thesis. There's also a um, trend reversal thesis. The thing I don't know is, will the global market go into a recession in 2016? Don't know. Looking really bad. It might. And that might skew my thesis a bit. And if it did, you might have your derivatives begin to unwind in a nasty way and that one or two or three degree off means you get 10 or 20 trillion dollars of disaster, which is bigger than what happened in 2008. And that would slow down my thesis. My thesis would be though, even if that happened, the bubble would still happen. It'd just be delayed to be washed through the immediate panic. Because we create alpha, nobody else in the world is right now. Okay, we'll take a question. Uh, I think this one is from Austin. If we're in a bubble, what are some safety nets in, inherent to the ecosystem that might make the bubble burst different and less depressing than the last dot-com bubble burst? Well, first of all, if you're from Austin, I hope he's a fan of Asleep at the Wheel. Just, just a question. Um, that's a real band. I don't know if you guys know them, right? Sleep at the Wheel. I think we already answered that in part. The, the thought would be, if this thing breaks, and it isn't a panic sale of the retail investor rushing to get out, but these seasoned vets at places like Fidelity sort of hold on. Or put it differently, because so many unicorns are not liquid, you can't dump the stock. And so what happens in that case is you don't have the feeling of a total collapse 
with one caveat, and it's a big caveat. So the question you should be asking me is what advice would I give to a company to withstand the bubble correcting, okay? Good question. Okay, so it's the other side of what you're saying. If you're a company that can slow down your growth and glide path to being cash flow positive, you'll survive the correction, the collapse, the bust. If you're a company that still needs gobs of money to keep growing like crazy to get to that point, you are a dead duck, okay? Now, in the unicorn world, there are a lot of companies with negative gross margin businesses, that's not a good place to be, that require gobs of money to get to the point where their sustainable growth can pay for their overhead. Those are roadkill if there's a bust too soon. And so if my timing's right, either maybe 18 to 24 months before the correction, or if we have this trend reversal, maybe get 36 months. These, these companies have to think, I've got to grow fast enough with gobs of money to the point I can glide path to being positive and control my own fate, or I'm a dead duck. That's what they should be thinking. Okay? And so, one lesson we learned from 2000 is don't keep on raising gobs of money and growing like crazy. This, so people did learn that lesson. Whether they apply it is unclear. So if you're a startup, you know, I'm not sure how many unicorns there are here, but uh, probably Okay, not. let's ask. How many unicorns? <laughs> not that many. We got so, one. Okay. So Actually, a different question. How many female founders we have here? Or at least CEOs? One, two, three, four. four. You said at least CEOs. I thought there was a period. Okay, you have a... Okay. <laughs> So, um, you know, for, for most of the Not audience good. members and probably folks that are tuning in as well uh, that may have raised some money, uh, this seems like it may be a challenging period. So if you've raised some seed funding and you're now, you know, proving, proving the model, building a scalable, predictable model, you're looking for a, a Series A or maybe you're looking for a Series B, you know, what, what advice do you give these folks? So you, you have to ramp, in order to get a Series A, you have to prove traction. So you got to really, you know, ramp up your burn. I mean, what what advice do you give to you know the the folks out here that aren't unicorns? Because of the fear that the bubble's going to burst, because of this wall of worry, a lot of venture investors have been shifting away from growth, growth, growth to unit economics. And whether they're right, not everybody. There's some contrarians that are still trying to go growth, growth, growth. But basically, you're better off if you really have a solid economic story in your company and they think they're investing in a sustainable company as opposed to, I've got to grow very fast and I'll monetize later. So in other words, a lot of the consumer apps that used to be well, well funded are having a more difficult time getting through the gates. The bar is much higher and the metrics to get funding are different. But those with good unit economics that are still growing well are quite fundable right now. Are you seeing, you know, there's, there's been a number of uh, later stage VCs that have uh, basically said uh, they're putting the pencil down. Have you found that with any of your portfolio companies in the later stages that there's been some pullback from later stage investors? No, no, I've seen a different phenomenon. It's kind of interesting you put it that way. Um, let me attempt to be colorful. I know I'm pretty bland sometimes. Colorful. Um, what's happening in the venture markets is the hedge funds, PE firms, mutual funds, I'll call them Huns, because they start with an H, Huns. The Huns are coming down, down, down. They used to only do billion dollars and up. We had one of the Huns do a round for one of our companies that was in the low hundred millions. Now then the next set of investors below these people and above venture are the growth funds. They just call them Goss, to be colorful, start with the G. So these Huns are putting pressure on the Goss, and the Goss would normally do the 100 million to 500 million rounds, they're getting pushed down into the venture, into the empire of venture capital. And they're actually, I've seen Goss come down to 40 pre type of rounds. And that's been interesting, because that puts pressure on the normal venture fund, which if they don't behave quickly enough and act quickly enough, the Goss steal the deal. So I've actually, the people that are saying they put the pencil down, maybe, I've seen a lot of venture funds actually quicken the pace to avoid getting preempted by Huns coming down to Goss and Goss coming down to the VCs. Wow, the landscape is definitely changing. Kind of the way Super Angels change it for VCs. That's correct, change of the rent. Other questions? Oh, let's give uh, somebody else here. Yeah. 
So uh, the number of users using uh, cell phones and computers has increased to what it was in 99 and basically at that time the consumers were only focusing on the United States. Right now we're seeing a lot of technology boom in other countries like India, China and other third world countries. So don't you think that that has enhanced the base of technology even a family of four would have like five to six devices as compared to what it was in 99, there were like one or two devices per family. Like you have to have a computer, that's it. There's nothing beyond it. So wouldn't that affect the, uh, uh, what the growth we're seeing, wouldn't that complement it? It has affected it in a very profound way. Almost all the profit of the mobile industry goes to one company. I'm one of the cult boys. I got a watch on, I got an iPad, I got an iPhone. Um, it's an amazing phenomenon. But the cell phone business is still growing, but it's growing at the low end, and so it's, it's no longer the heyday of rapid growth of mobile. I mean, Apple almost got to a trillion dollar market cap, because mobile's an amazing thing. Facebook, we're up to 300 billion market cap, and they're doing an incredibly good job of getting out to the emerging markets. And they're fighting over these, these very people because they're trying to do much more than just make immediate money. They're looking at the long term. How can they bring these people into the modern world? And how, they can, how can they serve them? You've got to step back in total amazement and just wonder at how well this is working out. I, I do. But stock markets are not rational. In fact, they, you know, the statement that Keynes made is markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. What he meant by that is a stock market will drive up the price of a Tesla way beyond its current value, or Snapchat, in anticipation downstream it'll catch up. And so what happens in these businesses, it happened in the 83 PC bubble, happened in the dot-com bubble. The values got way out of hand, but the real companies emerged out of the bursting of the bubble. And as you know, Sunsan found, he made 40 times as money in the 10 years after the bubble than during the bubble. Same thing will happen here. The companies that get through this are going to become enormous, powerful companies over the next 10 or 15 years. And they're going to do what you're talking about. But the stock market's not going to wait for them. You get my point? Okay. A question from the, um, the virtual audience. Um, when there's a bubble, which areas do you think will be hit hardest? When the bubble bursts? Yeah. Is this a question geographically? I, Metaphysically? I Existentially. <laughs> Existentially. Uh, are there any oh, areas, my, my you know, segments. yeah. What, what happened in 2000 was the dot-com bubble burst first, March, April. The telecom <laughs> bubble didn't burst till September, October. So it was kind of like a rolling bubbles. I put this chart up just to tell you, you know, bubbles happen in a micro and a macro way. I'm saying the big one hasn't happened. It's like the big earthquake hasn't happened. Doesn't mean there haven't been other things. Seed was in a very, very incredible bubble. And you can see here, this, this is like seed funding rounds peaked and has dropped very rapidly. So in effect, you could say the seed bubble already burst a year ago. Did you guys all miss it? Already burst. Um, here's another view of the same chart on a quarterly basis. The parabolic rise and then the drop is pretty vivid, I would think, right? And the era of angels has closed. I did a blog post on this. I was kind of very wistful. It's, I felt like it's um, the elves were leaving Middle Earth. The <laughs> angels are. What I mean, you can see the angel seed dollars are dropping, but a lot of angels became seed funds. They institutionalized, and their behavior changed. And so they did bigger rounds and fewer of them. And the whole character of this business has actually changed in the last year, year and a half. It's not been widely recognized. Angelus. You can see this thing has fallen off. You have a question, I think, for me about crowdfunding, but you can see how it's fallen off as well. So what happens when this has already happened, the bubble exuberance in angel and seed has already changed pretty seriously, gone to a more mature, different stage. And just like I said with the 83 or the 2000 thing, the, the super angels and seed fund winners are beginning to emerge out of a murk of a lot of them. Just like you know, the winners emerge out of the other bubbles. So this market's already becoming more consolidated. 
That's the only part. Do you think the question is more to it than just this type of microcosm? You know, I, I guess the uh, the um, individuals really looking to see if there are certain sectors that, that are going to be hit harder. Well, as I was others. saying, consumer yeah. consumer seems to have had its own little heyday and it's getting rarer and rarer and rarer. So can, and Snapchat was kind of out of the blue. It's great. Yik Yak may make it. Who knows? But there's been things that have come along that have popped and there's fewer and fewer. If we did a, a unicorn, like a blessing of unicorns, we did whatever it was, a, a pride of consumer, you would find that it was very, very dense for a while that it's thinning out. So that's already past its heyday and the winners are consolidated. SAS may be getting near that point. If SAS advocates something, oh, no, 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 SAS is going to go on forever. I don't know. Some of these big companies have 40 different subscriptions to little SAS products. They can't deal with it. So what's going to happen is SAS will begin to consolidate up like enterprise software did back in the 90s. So SAS may already be. There's, but I think what's still in front of us. So if I was going to recommend everybody think about the future, it's the following. What makes this era of computing fantastic, it actually gets back to what was said in the back. What makes it fantastic, so in the 80s it was engineers selling to engineers. For the female entrepreneurs it was dudes to dudes, right? How boring is that? In the, in the dot-com era, it was a lot of enterprise software or networking sold to networking dudes. Very boring. This era, though, is technology is now eating real businesses, not just tech-to-tech. -tech. It's not just IBM at risk. All right? It's taxis with Airbnb and hotels, Airbnb and Uber. We're actually now invading real markets in the real world. There's a whole world out there of these markets, and they've been barely tapped so far. Just a few have done. And this is global, not just local. So if I was going to make a recommendation, start thinking about how you can use technology to totally upend and change real businesses as opposed to tech businesses. I think that's going to persist. I think if we look back in about 10 or 12 years, we're going to go, wow, that really was an amazing wave across the whole world, more than the next SaaS product sold to a boring enterprise company. Uh, go ahead. <coughs> Yeah, Duncan, what's your opinion of the SEC Regulation A+, plus that's been approved recently? Reg A's been around for a long time, so I don't know if you guys know Reg A. Yeah, I know, Reg A was a creation a long time ago of a simple IPO process. You have to register, but it's not anything like a real IPO. The limit used to be $5 million. And back in 1945, that was a lot of money. It's worth $50 million. Now it's all, and now the limit Reg A+, plus is $50 million? $20 million or $50 million. Okay. So, for those who don't know, Reg A Plus lets you do a little tiny simplified prospectus, file it with no review in the SEC, and sell your stock to widows and orphans. Okay? Non uh, investors. Yeah, non accredited investors. Now, personally, good thing, my point of view, democratization of wealth, let everybody play in this party. There'll be money lost, there'll be money gained. I think it's a good thing. Um, here's, my, here's my issue. They took so long. When was the Jobs Act passed? 2009? That's like a whole generation ago. You know? Think about this. They should have been out here. This is, this is only a few, you know. I wish this, they got the regs out five years ago and the institutions could have been created. I am worried. I would love it if it worked. I am worried that this change in the angel industry is not going to be changed by crowdfunding. I'm just worried. But I've seen some people do reggae deals. I saw a reggae deal come out of Hawaii, raised $5 million, IPO. Um, it went from, got up to like is seven. Is reggae the same thing as party rap? No, 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 just, just a simplified filing. It's like, you know, the government take it away and give it back. So they took away the mid-cap small IPO when they got rid of decimalization, which you can read about. They blew up the small investment banks. They made it onerous to go public in the real world. And reggae plus restores a small offering. So. I saw this one offering go, and it went out, and it got up to like 700 million market value. It's dropped down to maybe 300 million. Here's what the problem is: there's no institutional support for it. So you put it on the marketplace. You don't have any handle. You don't have a lot of support, market makers, and it sort of becomes a semi-liquid stock. Exchange is an exchange on any. This might have gotten an exchange. I'm not sure. It might have gotten a value to be an exchange. But if nobody cares, nobody cares. So you end up with this phenomenon where these stocks get to be orphans, and nobody trades them, and it's hard to revitalize interest in them. We used to tell people, don't go public in these small exchanges like London or Japan or Australia. It's like a roach motel. You can check in, you can't check out. Because if your stock falls off, nobody cares, you can't raise any more money. 
You're from New York. You get that joke, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and, you know, but I, I really do hope Reg A plus works. I, you can see my concerns. There's a lot more to create a system, a system than just one regulation, and the other pieces may not be in place for it, like market makers, real market support, and so forth. Yeah, you know, I've got a couple of clients that are in that valley of death, public but unable to raise funds in the public market, and you can't raise them in the private market either. So it's tough. Got a question over here. Uh, thanks for the talk, actually, it was very useful and informative. I have a two-part question, so one, basically trying to uh, intentionally think away from what you're thinking, actually, or basically trying to think it's not a bubble, and another one, basically agreeing with you wholeheartedly it's a bubble and trying to learn from your experience or prediction, actually. So the first part is basically like trying to say that the world wants to invest in uh, entrepreneurism and new things that are coming up, like, like new businesses rather than new technology, actually. Like, completely new things have changed the world and there's only one spot to do it or one way to do it so maybe that's why everything is going up like google comes up with new things and then it keeps on growing for a very long time then people predate it actually so the bubble will still continue for some more time and then dies so that's one part of the thinking actually and the second part is basically totally agreeing with you and saying hey how long will this last actually like will the, all the investments go away and all of us have to basically find out new jobs and stuff being entrepreneurial and everything, so that's uh, two things. Well, first of all, the, the, if you look at the U.S., in fact, the whole world, new business starts, <coughs> small business, everybody, all pop, there's a debate tonight, they probably said small business 50 times, I love small business. New business starts in the U.S. are the lowest they've been in anybody's memory, and they're getting lower, lower, lower. New business failures are higher than new business starts. We're actually eating into and destroying our small business base. This is economic death for an economy. It just, it just is a suicide. Um, as a, so a lot of reasons why it's occurring, I don't go through them, but I really strongly believe in startup culture. Uh, Paul Graham said it great, which is, in the old days, you go to college, you have two choices, get a job, go to grad school. You probably had a third choice, go to law school, but nobody, go to law, nobody should go to law school. But he said, let's create a new third choice. Get a job, go to grad school, or start a company. And YC was founded on that principle. This, you know, Silicon Valley, forget tech and engineers and all that. If we could somehow take this startup culture idea around the world, around the country, to Detroit, for God's sake, you would create more value in this, company, this country and the world than tech startups. They'd be spread and diffused, and it wouldn't be venture back, but it would, it would change so many people's lives. I've actually been trying to get involved with this here or there and trying to do what I can. I really believe in this. And the one thing I'm really worried about, I'm not really worried about stuff like this. There's other ways. Cap capital will find a way. It may not be crowdfunding, Reg A+. Plus. It'll find a way. What I'm worried about is that if the bubble bursts, it kills startup culture. We're starting to get this thing going worldwide. It's a spreading of entrepreneurship, risk, this whole thought, you can run a company. We're spreading it worldwide. I hate for that to get killed by the end of the bubble. That's actually my biggest worry. Second side of your question. If I was going to give advice to anybody, you didn't really ask me this, I was going to give you advice. If you go back to the 83 thing I talked about, okay, maybe your no-name computer company never went public, but the opportunities kept growing for you, and you could position yourself in 94 to go join Netscape. I had a lot of friends at Apple, and they sort of, and a mob rolled over to Netscape, and they caught that craze. And so, people today doing your startups, let's say you don't get funded, or you do get funded, or you get caught up in the bubble, and oh my God, don't worry about it. You're here not for a startup, but a career. There's gonna be another one after this. We pretty well know some of the contours of it. We, you probably all know this, you know, robotics, cognitive computing, AI, all these things are gonna take all our jobs away. We keep going. <laughs> 3D printing, right? self-driving cars, drones, all this crazy stuff. It may not get fully mature in this era, this bubble, but it will in the next one, plus other things. And it's going to Just think, think about 3D printing. Uh, imagine you, somebody's trying to 3D print a car. Um, so right now, the way the world works is the Chinese mine raw materials out of Australia. Just huge amounts of iron and coal ship it up to China, and they build iPhones, and they ship it to us into Europe. Now, so you have this whole global flow that way. What if you could 3D print this down the street, 
and suddenly you don't take raw materials out of Australia and put them in China and ship them over here. You take sort of cool, refined metals and things out of Australia, they go up the value chain. You ship them all over the world, and that gets printed down the block. The total structure of global commerce will invert. The supply chain will simply invert. It'll be one of the greatest disruptions in a long, long time. Now, for people that want to be startup culture techies, you know, it's kind of fun to go after the taxis. Nobody likes taxi drivers and take them down like Uber did. And you can see them fighting back with government regulation. It's kind of a fun thing. How cool is this? What if you could take down the whole global supply chain? That's something to aspire to. I think you should all think. I think we should all think about it. You're here to make a career in startup culture. And you're, you're here to learn skills and get talent. And even if your startup doesn't work, keep going. Because when the next wave occurs, I think this wave is pretty big. If, if the PC era was like 40 good companies and the dot-com was 200, this might be 1,000. The next one might be 5,000. Glorious moment. So you might go through the bad times and it comes back in. Just keep that in your mind. That's what you be, should be aspiring to. Take down the global supply chain and have a lot of fun. Great. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Duncan, that was a great answer. Uh, my question is, is, past the seed, you're making a pitch to a Series A investor. How much emphasis do you put on IPO, or should the emphasis be on the B and C round? <clears throat> the, I raised some, I did four startups, and I had to go pitch the normal Series A back in the normal Series A days. It's kind of funny totally changed today. Um, so what I'd recommend you're focused on is, now I see a lot of pitches, people ask me for advice, good, bad pitch. So just think of it this way, the pitch is full of concept, you're not going to get funding. If you've got a real company, you're not going to talk concept, you can talk results. What you'd be thinking about at the Series A or B level is, what are my results, what's my business structure, what miles, milestone do I achieve on the money? That's the pitch. The pitch isn't, this is a really cool idea, here's my product, here's all this technology I put into it. No, that's not the right pitch anymore. So my recommendation to people is, do a pitch which looks like a real company that needs money to fix the sales model, keep growing, et cetera. See what I'm getting at? And don't think about, don't think getting to a B, if you get the A, is the goal. So that's not the goal. We have people come into us, so bullpen, you do post C, I want to bridge to an A. And I say, that's very interesting. Most bridges I find are piers. They go halfway out in the lake, right in the water. Get out of here. I don't want to do a bridge. And then they say, well, I say, what's your milestone with this money? I want to get the A round. I say, well, good luck. Hope you find the A round. That's not a milestone. That's a result. A milestone might be I get 100 million monthly actives. Right? I prove out my business model. I'm growing 4x year on year, and I'm going to get to a 250 ARR. Those are, those are milestones. They're real. They're getting an A is a consequence, it's not the goal. So get your head around the reality of your business, how much money you get to the next level, and make the next level not more money. You got it? Uh, there was, a... was a question about crowdfunding, and I know we kind of touched on this, but what is your what are your thoughts on uh, crowdfunding and how that may be impacted when the bubble bursts? And what does that really mean for innovation? Well, first of all, I think Naval and Angelist, marvelous innovation. I celebrate the innovators, innovators in finance. So Paul Graham, YC, incredible innovation. Josh Koppelman, first round capital, great innovation. I love that. So, so Naval and Angelist, fantastic innovation. It'll continue. It'll continue. I don't think it goes away. It just, my worry is this. It, it, he's trying to make this a very fundamental thing. He's actually trying, if you think about it, he's not really trying to go after VC, he's trying to go after angels. He's trying to systemize the angel market and become one of the greatest angel systems out there. I hope he pulls it off. My worry about this is when the bubble ends, the desire to play the innovative game will, will diminish. Innovation thrives during a bubble. After the bubble, everybody goes, wow, I told you that idea wouldn't work. And you get this inertia that slows you down. So I think Naval, Kickstarter may have gone past, remember I said you get to a point where you can be sustainable? These guys may be past that point, I hope they are, and they'll sustain. I, a lot of others probably won't. Hi, 
uh, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, so uh, thinking a little bit uh, more tactically, uh, given that uh, many of us are here and uh, we're looking at the scenario, uh, what, what would a strategy be to beat out your competitor? If you were out looking for seed funding, uh, what would you do? It's kind of a hard question. But well, let me give you a it's sort of a broad question. How do you raise money at seed and beat the competitor? And I'll give you a, a very unsatisfying answer, but I think it's the right answer. I, I see a lot of deals flow through, and they claim to be different. And the difference is minor. You get a red PC, not a green one. But I mean, you get more sophisticated than that, but the differences are not major. And then I ask them a question. Okay, what is your sustainable competitive advantage? What actually creates a monopoly? What actually gets you to a point where you can grow like crazy and they can't catch you? And they don't have an answer because they're not thinking that way. So a lot of the seed companies are incremental improvements on in what exists, not fundamental improvements. So I tell people, get fundamental. Do something profound and different. It's harder to raise money, actually. It's actually very funny. You would think, better mousetrap, you all get some money. It's not the way the world works. Um, there's a lot of better mousetraps never get any money. Most venture people, see, man is a herd animal. Right? We're all sheep at some level. And so venture people tend to do what the venture people do. So all the time in venture, you see one idea gets funded, and there's 10 others of minor derivation difference because they got a better team or a better this. Not fundamental. What you should be trying to do is do something where you are the one in a market. Now, being the one is very, very risky. Let me give you a little, I'll give you some aphorisms like wall of worry and all that. Do you guys know the three rules of real estate? Everybody know those rules? Yeah. Okay, somebody, what are they? Okay. What are the four rules of venture capital? What is it? No, it's too early, too early, too early, too late. Often, if you have a unique idea, you're too early. So it's a combination of getting the right timing and having a, a big enough competitive advantage and distinction that if you hit it, you're going to grow like crazy. A good example. Very, very old and used, but a good example is Facebook. So my prior venture fund was in MySpace, and at one time was a great company. My partner in the venture fund was in Tribe Networks, you probably don't remember, but LinkedIn, Tribe, and Friendster were the first three of the modern social networks. And LinkedIn got through, the other two didn't. I think Facebook was the 240th social network funded. So why Facebook? Well, they had two amazing things going for them. Number one, real names. Other than LinkedIn, everybody else was fake names. You know, um, Sally Joe 47, fake names. And so you weren't a fake, you were real. The second was their distribution model early on in colleges was brilliant. Inclusive in the college, exclusive of all the people with non-EDU addresses. You trusted it more than you would a normal social network. So they were distinct enough, and later they, they figured out the news feed, and then they took off like crazy. And b having been involved with MySpace, we saw them coming up the tailpipe. And once they got where they started, no way could MySpace ever catch up. Its whole structure was fakes their names. It never could catch up. Its whole model was wrong compared to that. So that's an example where you might be late to the market, but you're so distinct, and you had a profound insight, you ran and became one of the great companies. Is that helpful? Okay. A question from um, the virtual audience. Um, if there's a bubble and it bursts, might this give the rest of the world an edge over Silicon Valley? Should entrepreneurs keep that possibility in mind? No. <laughs> Why not? He didn't ask that. <laughs> you added that. <laughs> the history of bubbles and technology. There's a, this is, hope you don't mind if I go into history, is that okay? Is, Goss, Huns, whatever. All yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I can't help myself. I live with the Huns, you know, I've been around a while. So, the history of technology. Detroit was the center of cars, Pittsburgh of steel. St. Louis originally, St. Louis, the center of food, and it moved to Chicago. And Chicago's held it for 150 years. And when you went globalization, the center in Stuttgart and near Tokyo and cars competed very directly with Detroit. It's a shell of itself. But it's a trivia question. Um, what city in the United States in the 1950s had the highest average wages and net worth? 
Average, not for total. Detroit, Michigan. Amazing how far they've fallen. The point is, technologies cluster, and they maintain the cluster a long time until they get stupid or something changes. Detroit just got stupid. Milan is the center of design, fashion design. Has held it for a long time. You get the idea. Silicon Valley is the center. It was competing with Boston for a while. Um, Boston picked the wrong technologies. Silicon Valley won. This center is going to save the center despite all attempts to knock it off its perch until the core technology foundation shifts. And we shifted from semiconductors to software brilliantly or luckily, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no way. When we go down, the rest of the world goes down. And when we come back, they'll come back after us. Okay. Question here. Um, yeah, I, I, I was, uh, Duncan, I did, was very interested in your ideas about growth versus profitability. And uh, recently, you're familiar with Solar City, and um, Solar City has made a, a decision rather than to keep their you know growth extremely high like they've been to level off their growth, uh, work on their costs, and, and become cash flow positive with the idea of the, in 2017 that the tax credit for solar systems is going to expire. And um, so, so it, it's, it, it's interesting where you have a company that des decides, you know, that they're going to scale back their growth and switch toward a profitability bottom line. I was just wondering what you think of that in particular with solar city. Is that, of course, their stock dived down real big because of that. But Okay, I can answer that, I yeah. think. But first, let me step back. I actually didn't say profitability. I said good unit economics. Well, well I, I meant actually, I, rather than profitability, I really meant cash flow. Yeah, but, but I'm not saying all these market. companies, you're all going to need gobs of money to grow. Right. You're not going to escape that. The, the lean technology, lean startup system is lean for a while, but when you start going up the curb, you end up catching up with the fat system in terms of gobs of money to grow. The amount of capital it takes to get to be a scale company hasn't fundamentally changed. It's just cheaper to get going. Okay, so in that period, you're all get going companies. In that period of get going, you have to be more focused on unit economics, but you still have to grow, 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 grow. So if, you, if you're growing on negative and bad economics, you're going to be roadkill. If you can grow on good economics, you're going to probably get through it. Solar City is a different case. There was a clean tech bubble. There was one in the 80s, there was another one now in the 90s, and the aughts, and they both had the same endpoint. So, story. There was a company called Luz. This is uh, started in 78, 79 out of Israel. They were the best in solar thermal, mirrors in the desert. You've seen all the movies on it. And they had like 90% market share until 91 when the subsidies ran out, they went bankrupt. And they showed up again in a Luz 2 and later called a bright source in the mid aughts. And they had a better idea of how to build it. And they built the Ivanpah plant outside of Vegas, which you guys can read a lot about if you're interested. Um, the problem with clean tech is that it's based upon subsidies and laws which require use of the technology. It's not based upon core economics. And they're hoping that the economics get down to parity faster than the subsidies run out. It's a race against that. And who knows if they're going to make it or not. Solar's been subsidized for 30 years. It's still not a parity. It's, it works well where Solar City does it on rooftops, retail. It's arbitraging retail rates. They're not a parity yet in the desert. So Solar City is making the right decision. I don't know if they're going to get past the race, but I wouldn't. I'd say that's a specific example. It does. It shouldn't inform you as to the more general, unless you're in the clean tech business or the government regulation subsidy business. The problem with the government as an investor or a supporter in regulation is it comes with a huge cost. There's a reason why venture has put very little money and very few successes in education or med tech, med medical, you know, core medical. And I know we have what you're, you're yeah, doing, yeah. Him, but. The reason is, they're so regulated, you, you know, venture capital doesn't like regulations. They go around the rocks in the river, and these are huge rocks. And so it's been very difficult for the venture guys ever to make any money in those markets, even though they tried, tried, tried. Clean tech worked for a while because it was so subsidized. Subsidies goes away, it's going to be hard, because you're trapped in a regulatory quagmire you don't want to deal with. You just have to know the rules of the game. Yes, I mean, there are examples, your example may work, Tiger Tech seems to be working, yes. There are examples you, you can make a hay of it, but in general, it's been a difficult place to win. Okay. You have a question? There was a question from um, from one of our virtual audience members. 
Uh, is this a good time to start a startup? And if the bubble bursts, or when the bubble bursts, is that a good time to start a startup? Well, um, I'd love to say start at any time. But I, I think the, the real answer, looking at history, um, Cisco was started in 1984. And the PC bubble burst in 83, and it was too late to get through the window. And companies got out. Lotus and Compaq went public in 84, but they both went from zero to $100 million in one year. Amazing companies. A bunch went public in 86, like Microsoft, but they were around for eight or 10 years. Oracle. Cisco took a long time before it began getting in, and it caught the next wave. The, and look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn started in 01. It really didn't take off until 07. So the point is this. History says by far the best time to start a company is in the trough after the bubble burst. Not while it's bursting, not in the, not in the, you know, the, the, not here, <laughs> down here. It's sort of a general rule. If you, if you um, get something started at the bottom or you invest at the bottom, you're in the best position, but you gotta last a long time. And so it's a different mentality. Yeah, I noticed a number of, a number of clients that started in 08, people laid off, people that, uh, you know, it was sort of nuclear winter for them. Uh, that had the possibility, the capabilities to bootstrap, you know, came through very well. Um, but it's tough. I mean, it's incredibly tough. But there yeah. are great hiring opportunities. You well, know, here's what I want to say to the, again to the audience and people here. Again, you, your thing might get out, you might get liquid, you might make a lot of money, you might be happy people. You may miss this thing. Don't worry about that. You just want to get the skill and position. You're going to play the game several times. The guy that did Uber, if you go back to his history, he had, he had he had some good ones, some bad ones, and a long you know, drought. And then El Nino hit, and he did well with Uber. So you just look at it, look at the history of a lot of these people, and you, they're not just up. Let me step back. Most people rewrite their history. It was all easy. But the reality is it never was easy. Twitter had a hard time raising money. Twitter went to 20 venture funds, couldn't raise a dime, and went to a Boston fund to raise money. Think about that, Twitter. So, it's always hard, they rewrite history, just expect it to be hard, that's part of the fun of this thing, I guess, the fun of the life. Um, but yes, not now, not in two years, at the trough point when the next set of technologies emerge, get in early, that's the best place to do it. To your point, we had Gary, uh, Gary Swart, the CEO of Odesk, before he sold the company and went in as a venture partner, Polaris, he said, experience is what you get from a startup when you don't get anything else you want. So, uh, to Duncan's point, you know, you may get lots of experience. Uh, any other questions here? Go ahead. I guess um, my question with Twitter is, so what was its unique thing? I, I used to be an inventor. Uh, I used to be a principal at a, at a debt fund. We did clean tech. It worked out great. Um, only the debt guys won. Um, but. You mentioned that the way that you get money is that you need to find that unique thing that makes you, you know, makes you better than the competition. Um, most of the th stuff that I saw got funded successfully was stuff that was a me too. Exactly. So in, in order to be successful in funding, herd animal. Yeah, in, in order herd to be animals. successful in funding, maybe to that gentleman's question, it might have been more be a good herd animal. <laughs> so, no, but it doesn't matter. It's no good being part of a pack and losing. It's better to take the risk and to fight the battle for something really important. Like, uh, it's just better, like helping the prisoners out or something. That, that's, that's a more important thing in your life, and it's better to do something a little off scale than to do what everybody else does. Here's what Twitter did. Um, Blogger was, the first company I did was Blogger, and Blogger got bought by Google for a glorious $5 million, everything, wow, big win. Uh, I went to the Blogger party, I have a Blogger t-shirt somewhere, it's kind of fun. And he went on to, he went on, he said, after blogging, we're going to do podcasting. So his original idea was to do podcasting. And he found that's too hard. Blogging's pretty easy, people do it, but podcasting, you have to have talent. You've got to be a radio talk show host. That was always my vision for myself. I never quite made it. Being, um, a being No, being a radio talk show host. <laughs> so you can see, right? So he, he pivoted. He's a classic pivot. And he said, okay, instead of doing something more complicated than blogging, I'll do something simpler, microblogging. So Twitter started off, it's 140 characters because SMS is 160 and you want a 20 for the header. That's how he determined the length. And it was meant to be status, hot, I'm happy, had a coffee. Really great stuff like that. That's what his insight was. 
go micro blogging. And it was an incredibly powerful insight because we have a whole generation of people that are ADD and millennials more than boomers, etc., and the centennials, oh my God. So the point of it is, that's his insight. It was profound. There was nobody else doing microblogging. He was unique, and he had cred from blogging, and he still had a struggle, but the win was great, we hope. That help? No, I, I just thought it was amusing, just seeing the number of companies funded as a Me Too versus the number that well, are funded 240 as 240 social a networks, network. right? 240 yeah. social networks would be different than Facebook. Well, we have a better look. Okay. Is that because of FOMA? But I would I would argue also that if Facebook coming in and saying, "Oh, we have actual names." I mean, it's you know, if you don't know for a fact that that's a game changer, it's like okay, so you got you have to use actual names. You know. That and its distribution model, and then he got lucky or got brilliant with the um, newsfeed. Yes, but okay, everybody take this lesson to heart. Two hundred forty social networks. MySpace is a big dog. Uh, LinkedIn's kind of limbering along, but a lot of roadkill. And you walk in, we're doing what everybody else does, but we have real names, right? And everybody says, aren't these disguised dating sites? How are you going to win? Okay, but he, he got past that. My, my point is, fine, let the sheep object and give their normal answer and just deal with it. He obviously had a brilliant answer. He got past it, right? I've had pitches from people, oh my God, you know, this sounds really off the wall. Then we but he makes us think and we work through it. There are VCs out there that, let me say this. I bet if you ask any VC friends, are you guys contrarian investors? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, but they're not. But there are some who are. I mean, uh, Mike Maples invested in, in Twitter. He's a classic, um, real contrarian. And he looks for exponential type ideas. Uh, Peter Thiel, everybody loves Peter Thiel. So Peter Thiel, he invested in Facebook. He's also a guy looking for zero to one and exponential growth and monopolies. He's looking for monopolies. He's looking for the difference. He's not trying to invest with 20 other SaaS companies. So they're out, they're out there. One advice that most founders don't follow is VCs are very different and they have different focuses and individual VCs are more important than the fund. You do your homework. Go find the contrarian. Go find. Don't make sure they don't already have Facebook in their portfolio, right? So, do your homework before you pitch. Don't try to pitch a lot of VCs. You're wasting their time and yours. Just it's a rifle shoot. Okay. Just one quick question that uh, has got nothing to do with the bubble, but you obviously see so many portfolio companies, so many companies coming in the door. What is there any one thing in particular that you see startup entrepreneurs doing? You go, oh my God, I just don't believe they're doing this. Is there any anything that you can give to the audience here uh, and watching just some words of wisdom, stuff to avoid? Well, we have a, um, we have a couple guidelines stuck on our website. Not that it's a great website, but the guidelines are kind of fun. My favorite my partner did is, no, I don't want to see your demo. <laughs> so the thing is, Hunter's coming in and saying, you got to see this technology. No, we don't. Well, you got to see it. He said, I'll tell you what, we assume it's the best in the world. Just tell me about your business. And so first of all, if they can't explain their technology before they show it, something's wrong. It, you know, it's like, I have to see it before I understand it. Okay, then it's probably too murky. But the second thing is, I'm investing in their business. I'm worried about the monopoly they create, the unfair advantage. How are they doing in the real world? what results are going to achieve in my money, less than I'm worried about, gee, that's really cool. I love your technology. And look, I'm a gadget guy. Look at me, I've got gadgets everywhere. I've got a Fitbit in my pocket. So, I mean, see my point? That's probably the biggest advice I'd give to people. Most VCs love the technology, and you spend all your time talking about your demo, and you show the demo, and so what? I assume it's great. If you're not great, you shouldn't be here. Like, we're all Donald Trump, we're all great. So you have to be great, right? So, Talk about your business and talk about your unfair advantage and talk about that and how you go to market. Don't talk about your technology. Any advice, you know, considering we may be entering bubble land, uh, any advice, you know, to the, the entrepreneurs watching, listening, sitting here in terms of what they should really, I know you've mentioned a couple of things, you know, get traction, just, you know, watch your burn. But anything else that you see people doing really dumb stuff, um, you know, at this stage of the game? Well, given this is a discussion of bubble, and I actually think we're not in it yet, 
and but it's looming. Yeah, but there may be a trend reversal delayed for a year. I mean, given that, don't time the market. If I didn't give one piece of advice at that level on the bubble, what the bubble means, don't try to guess the bubble. Don't time the market. You had examples of very storied VCs thinking it was a bubble two, three years ago. I know people out there, very, very good funds, who went underground. They, they had pencils dropped three years ago. <coughs> if you went pencil down in 98, you missed it. All the money that was made, you missed. There are examples of venture funds that got quiet and went pencil down in 97, 98. Now it's over. They missed it. They're not funds anymore. The funny thing about bubbles is, uh, I said, you know, you know you're in a bubble when they say, I got to do it anyway. That's true. If you stay out of the bubble, you miss it. And, you know, another Wall Street phrase, this is why don't, don't be a market timer is what I'm saying. Another Wall Street phrase, bears make money, bulls make money, pigs get led to the slaughter. <laughs> or, or as J.D. Rockefeller said, I never made money selling at the top. You can't time the top. So if you wait, wait, wait to make money at the top and you miss it, remember, these things drop parabolically. <laughs> they drop, oil went up to 147 in 2007 and dropped to 31 in six months. It took them you know, years to get up and it dropped. You're done, you can't get out. So don't try to time the market. Don't try to time this bubble. Understand the context when you talk to people like me or other venture people, but don't think about the bubble. Create a real business, get your business to work, Understand you got to be careful on unit economics. Okay? My advice is so don't worry about the bubble. Okay. And I know that you don't have enough deal flow. So uh, <laughs> uh, why don't you just tell the folks here, you know, Bullpen obviously is a great, is a great um, fund, but you seem to have some very varied investments. So for the folks that may be thinking they'd like to, uh, you know, send something in, what's your sweet spot? Uh, and Okay, I'll make the commercial really quick. The group of us have done a lot of startups. I did four, my other partner did four, one guy with three. Um, we just brought a new guy in who's done several. So we have a lot of operating experience. And we started doing angel investing in 2007 together. We, got, we did really well. We had um, Zynga, Marketo, um, Millennial Media, and it's worth over a billion dollars. A company called Tanium and Two Mogul. These are a group, group of companies if you know them, but they're back then. Um, in fund one, we went a little bit later than angel. We went into what we call post-seed, so we want you to get through your angel or seed round, have some trajectory, and then we invest. Post-seed really means post-product market fit. And in our fund, we have FanDuel and some other aspiring unicorns, kind of a cool fund. Our fund two, um, we're getting a little tighter in our model because we're getting later in this process. So you, made it, you, don't, you guys don't time the bubble, I have to. So I'm getting a little bit tighter in, in our decision making. I think most of you are probably too early for us. So you come to us when you have product market fit, you're growing, and you want somebody like us to come and help you build your business model fit. So we try to take people. What we're trying to do is take people from, we're kind of an early A round. We're trying to take people from a small post-seed round to a super size round, 10, 12, 15 million. Our track record's pretty good. Looked in fund one. I think 60% of our deal, 57 or 60, went from our post-seed to some womp, whomping big round, 12 or more, at a much higher value. So that's our game. We're trying to skip the five, six, eight million A because sometimes it's more of a trap. So we fit some models, not others. Post-seed, pre-A. Well, early A. Mark Andreessen calls it an early A. We're sort of front-running the A round, traditional venture people, and then trying to pop beyond them. Excellent. Well, thank you, Duncan. 